Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Talking Dirty, and we got back here once again, Mr. IRP, Jason Ingles, and Patrick Daniel. You didn't say it as good as last time, but you you, you had to self analyze yourself. Yeah, well, you if know, I said so. it now, it'd just be motor blower. Right, 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 yeah. right, right. Uh, cowboy colors for me, and uh, grayed out on each side. So, Fifty Shades of Gray in a different area here today. Shows uh, all kinds of dirty. Yeah, it? this is bad. This is gonna <laughs> get. This is real getting dirty. really. Hey, where's the whips and chains? We do have a audience member with us today. He doesn't matter. We also have another audience member, and it's in the form of a crate motor. And that's our first topic here today: the crate returns. Now. Last time you got a lot of heat uh, for the crate motor comments, he was all on your side. Now he's got one in a car, and now he's defending them, talking about here's how they say people. What, I, I, what, what's going on? Let's on start with you because, <laughs> because now, well, well, hold on, we'll, we'll let him start because he's the one that got all the, all right. the red rifle, Tyler Stevens mad at you and everything like that. So what is your response to these crate people out there defending them and all that? We were just talking about it off air how Money still is being put in these things that are way too expensive, uh, but they do help the weekly guy have a chance, I guess, the lower budget team. What, what's your response to the whole situation that you were in there? Man, I, I just, I know it's been a long time since I raced IMCA, and I know things went up a lot, but when we were getting our motors claimed all the time, I could build a motor from scratch for about 1800 to $2,000. I mean, you just put a set of Vortec heads on it, you had to spend a little money on the intake. Short block you could buy up there at Blaine's Motor Supply or City Motor Supply in Dallas. They charge you about 11, 1200 bucks if you carried them a core. I mean, shoot, for about two grand, you could build a motor that would run and win some features, you know. I sold a couple of them, unfortunately. Um, I'm not saying that's a win-win a proposition, but, you, you know, talking, you got to buy a crate motor for 6500 and then they're putting, you know, Jason said there's, you know, if you, if you buy their little tune to put on them and buy the good carburetor and the headers and the pulleys and, and whatnot you know you're spending another maybe ten thousand or something so now you got 16.5 in there well shoot man that's what i got in my usmts spec motor from from wells just you know so and it's not the it's not the best parts money can buy but it's it's pretty damn good stuff in there and uh you know jason brought up a valid point if once you already buy the accessories and you own them outright then you know if you have to replace the motor you're just looking at 6,500 bucks, but again, I, I'm not against the crate motor entirely. I just feel like they need to police it. Just don't walk up there and shine a flashlight. Oh, it's got a seal. That's it. And they shouldn't be your main class because they, they sound like station. They right. shouldn't that's be your, your main class because that seemed you know, to get a lot of people this station wagon reference, but a lot of people liked it too. You know, you had it was kind of like a 70-30 split there. You had 70% of the fans and USMTS type drivers like what you said, and then you had 30% that, uh, you know, that's all they can do and afford. It seemed yep. like that didn't like it, but. I mean, what's your opinion on that top class idea? I'm say modified, obviously a top class. They're dominated right now by the crates. Uh, what's I'm your neutral. rebuttal on you know, the crate and I, I love the outlaw stuff. I, I, I love racing, period. You know, but at the end of the day, we got to have more cars out there. And so my theory on it is we make that guy, you know, a cheaper combination. Yeah, it does. You know, Patrick was mentioning it costs $13,000 to get a total setup, but that's that includes a... You ain't got to buy that, but that includes a $2,000 carburetor, a $1,500 power steering pump set up, a, a high dollar pulley system. You know, there's a lot of, that includes the headers, you know, you re, to replace that motor. But the six, replacement of the crate was so guys can't put in more money to outdo another motor, just like you're speaking. Correct. You pull out on the, I was, wasn't really for them, but I, I went and run last year that race. And, and the biggest thing I had when we pulled out on the track was, we all had the same thing. It's up to the driver. You know, I we didn't have to worry about this guy having a, or in our mindset, thinking this guy had more than you. You had the same equipment when you pulled out on the track. Now, something I did have a conversation with the crate racer. He says, and this is something I don't like, one of the reasons I don't really care too much for how the factory stock races go sometimes, but a whole nother subject. We'll get to that later on. Uh, he was saying that, with these crate motors, if you set your car up good enough, it don't matter if that track is as slick as it wants to be, you can be wide open. He's talking about the power band in them. They don't really break the tires loose if you set the car up right. 
I don't know who would reference that. You know, I don't. I you mean, wouldn't know, but I yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know, that. but I can say that if any any class that you have to run around there wide open, one, that's not going to be any fun, right? And, and two, takes out driving hands. in it. Yeah, you know, I don't get me wrong, it's fun to run wide open, but it ain't fun to watch or ain't fun to. He was race saying that the power that band in them are, I, I are so low that it doesn't really break the tires loose because of the nah, horsepower. You still got to, you know, I've only run it one, you know, one weekend with three nights of racing. Uh, we run on a slick track. You had to control the throttle. You had enough power there to control the throttle, and you know still had to be. You still had to get your car set up to where you could run fast. You know, good drivers are still going to rise to the top, no matter what it is. But you know, the you're, I would I would disagree. You, you know, you got to control the throttle. So. I, I I I've never drove one. I, I wouldn't know. I mean, I've drove some stuff on seven cylinders and stuff like that. But <laughs> I feel like it's probably be about the same. But Again, man, I ain't, I'm not knocking it. I'm, I'm not saying that there's not a place for it, okay, guys? Just calm down. <laughs> Keep your T-shirt on. <laughs> but I'm just, you know, I think, one, they ought to tech it. Two, yeah. I don't think it saves quite as much money as everybody thinks that it does. You know what I mean? Um, you can still buy a few more horsepower is what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you can, you know, you can make more horsepower easily. But, you know, if a guy's raced a little while – you know or been in racing for a little while it you know he's probably got enough parts and pieces laying around to, to build a decent little motor you know here and there um but i'm not saying the crate deal is not a good deal and i'm not saying it's not real racing i'm not saying that it doesn't have its place i just i'm just saying you know at the end of the day when you're standing in the convenience store parking lot and bubba joe drives his three-quarter ton chevy with mud flaps down the road and it sounds like a crate motor you don't really think a whole lot of it you know right but if you have whatever your top class is and if it's modified it's great if it's sprint cars late model whatever it is if 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 you can feel the concussion in your chest when you're up there at the corn dog stand you, you're gonna put that down and go see what's happening on the racetrack you know what i mean right now um, it's hard to tell if it's i'm say modified or, or factory stock pretty much is that a problem <laughs> I, I could agree with you on that do they need I mean, to develop is, the, 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 the magna yeah. flow need to come out with the set or something what do we need to do I to fix I, this i, I you know I mean, I, I I I think that the I think that the chip rule that everybody has kind of gone to or went to you know uh, several years ago and started to implement I think that to a degree that's a good way of thinking you know because it any time that you turn your motors harder it decreases the longevity and the right. lifespan of them you know um, but you know if you're a fan geez it sure does sound cool and look good <laughs> you know what I'm saying it just I, I like watch racing as much as the next guy, and I've seen some kick-ass videos on Facebook of stock car races and crate races and IMCA modified races that, you know, you you couldn't you couldn't ask if, if the deal was staged, you couldn't ask for a better race. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's there's times that they put on a good a show or better than anything else out there. I'm just saying that you know they have their place. That's all I'm saying. You know, it, and it's not the end all be all <laughs> it's not going to save racing I, by itself I agree you know the excitement factor of that you know high horsepower you know watching them late models come up there and buzz the fence right where you're standing in front of it, it is an adrenaline rush you know for some people um you know it gets your attention you know it's i, I agree with you on it's, that. it did seem like the more complainers were not on the fan side of what you said it seemed like more of the complainers were the select few that race crate motors and want to feel like they're the main show of the events yeah and here's the deal if you gotta if you're a factory stock i mean i feel like i said it last week if, if you're a factory stock driver or you're a bomber driver or a sport mod driver it it doesn't make a damn there's somebody out there that's driving a factory stock that can run circles around me and jason and i have no doubts you know that's probably a wheel man Right. but doesn't have the budget or hasn't had the opportunity or, or, or whatever. Um, a real wheel, man. Not yeah, KR. Or, not a KR. Real, We're not talking yeah, about KR. For sure. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not taking anything away from those guys or, or their uh, class of racing, you know what I'm saying? That's not what I'm saying. But from a, from a fan standpoint, if you're looking at racing as a whole, which I feel like that's what we're trying to do here uh, across the board with our show, you know, you, you can't honestly tell me that that's the coolest thing to watch. You know what I mean? Night in and night after night after night, you know? It just isn't. That's why the 
touring series even here at some of our local tracks that have IMCA races they'll schedule a Tom's modified race or a USMTS race maybe just one or two but it's just a different atmosphere when those guys come in and and they got the big motors and you know different stuff and you know it, it's just something different for the fans to see you know you can't nobody's going to show up and watch the same crap every right. week you right. know they gotta have something a little different every now and again right so i mean there's Crate racing is no less of a form of racing. I'm just saying, all these guys that are standing up saying this is going to save racing and it saves money and it's the cheapest and best thing that ever happened, it ain't. It's bullshit, <laughs> you know? But that's just my opinion. Y'all got y'all's, I got mine. On to our next topic, and it's called The Shift. And The Shift, uh, kind of in the 90s, I think we all can kind of agree, the racing world went from being... Uh, you know, 80s, you could be a sprint car guy, you could be a road racing guy. I actually had a conversation with a driver who was a big name in that at that time, not going to name him. And uh, he was in, he was an IROC driver in the 80s. He, he, run, he ran the IROC, and I explained what changed, because I was like, well, you know how after, you know, stock car racing blew up, you know, everything kind of changed. He's like, yeah, and I'm like, well, there might be a reason for that. And he's like, what do you think it is? You know, because everybody's tried to figure out what, what happened. And I'm like, uh, you know, Days of Thunder and Jeff Gordon were very, very similar, you know, and movies, you know, media moves the masses completely. I mean, when did street racing become big, Fast and the Furious? When did local drag racing kick off, you know, Street Outlaws? Uh, Top Gun inspired so many people to become fighter pilots. Um, and you look at this, this uh, movie that occurred in 90, you know, it was uh, based on Tim Richmond. Uh, but Hendrick was a big supporter of the movie being made, you know, and Hendrick just started in 1984, you know, that's a good book, by the way, 1984, check it out. Uh, but basically, he came, he came in here, you know, co-trickle with this, you know, California sprint car guy, no funding to go to Indy, all that crap. Uh, young gun, gets on the track racing the man in black, multi-time cup champion. Uh, they, and they try to say, you know, I had this discussion this week. People were like, well, the movie's based on Tim Richmond. Well, according to stats, ladies and gentlemen, Tim Richmond is from Ashland, Ohio. Uh, he ran sprint cars, yes, but he also raced Indy cars. And he ran the Indy 519A. He was Rookie of the Year, by the way. Uh, and he did do good. 86, 87, he drove for Hendrick. He had uh, nine wins in two years. Uh, that really don't sound like Cole Trickle too much to me. You have Jeff Gordon, though, who comes along after the movie. He was racing sprint cars in the 80s, wing, non-wing. Uh, and, you know, he, his story's a little similar. California sprint car driver, no funding to go to Indy. That's where he wanted to go. Um, and then you look at Cole Trickle. California sprint car guy, ran Outlaws and All-Stars. We always remember that line. You know, Two-time World of Outlaws, seven straight feature wins. Well, Wikipedia says that he never run World of Outlaws or All-Star. Wikipedia, I don't know if it's Mandela Effect. Mandela Effect, Wikipedia says he ran USAC. Now, Jeff Gordon ran a lot of USAC at the end of his later stages, but Coach Trickle never did. Now, what I'm trying to say is movies do target young people's minds. The way people were targeting, I mean, military even admits that Top Gun was used to try to get people to sign up for the military, for the forces, you know. A lot of movies were instilled to get, to inspire kids. What I'm saying is before this movie came out, before it almost literally came to life with Gordon, Ern, Gordon Earnhardt being rowdy and trickle, and you see NASCAR still uses it today with Colin Driver's rowdy and all that crap, the movie still comes on, somebody's still watching the damn thing, and I'm pretty sure I know who it is. But before this, it was cool to be Steve Kinzer. It was cool to be Scott Bloomquist. Your goal as a dirt track racer was to be the best dirt track racer that there was. And same thing with Trans Am, same thing with Indy. But after this came along, your goal was no longer to be those guys. Your goal was to be, as we said last time, the guy who set the stone was to be Jeff Gordon. And I'm saying it wouldn't it have been that big of an impact without this movie occurring. Because you look at Ken Schrader, he came along and, you know, won in 88, 89. He was a sprint car guy who, you know, was doing the same thing that Gordon did. Gordon did come along, but it took him three years to start dominating. You know, so, I mean, I really think that, you know, 
it's smart for NASCAR to use Hollywood to promote their sport. They're trying to take over. You also had the Indy split happen just a few years after that. It was all like a great collaboration that really took NASCAR to the next level. And I think that this took a lot of dirt track minds from cheering Kinzer and Bloomquist to cheering on Cole to making that the cool thing, you know, because that's one of the main reasons I, I held. Before I started researching the sport, I, I used to love Days of Thunder. Love Jeff Gordon was my favorite driver. And then I started realizing, well, why did I really like Jeff Gordon so much? And it's because I love this movie of this California sprint car guy, the, the dirt guy beating the asphalt guy in NASCAR. And that's exactly what we've been dipped into. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It definitely, I feel like, uh, was the perfect storm when, it, when everything hit, you know. And I, and I have no doubts that the media is responsible for so much of the mentality of the american people you know oh, we talked about this with diet and all kinds of stuff it goes yeah. way deeper than racing for yeah sure. for sure it does and so if you know if i owned a company and which i do by the way first class auto glass you need any glass work um but you know if they were fixing to make a movie about that and, and somebody else and i thought i could you know benefit from that movie being made i'd absolutely be all over it i don't know i mean that's just and Good Hendrick being sense. behind it, and even Jeff Gordon, when you go and watch it, uh, Ray Evernham has a photo where they tried to number him 46. Like, same as Cole, they tried to number him 46, but NASCAR didn't allow it because the movie had the rights to the number. Wow. So, I mean, it. Uh, people want to say it's the movie's based on Tim Richmond. Do you really think they're going to come out and say it's based on our future star uh, that we're going to put in this car that has a similar background as the character? Like, what are they going to say? It's based on a future NASCAR driver. They can't say that. It's got to be based on somebody else. Right. You know, so. Yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't think it would be Tim Richmond. From what I understand, he was he was pretty flamboyant and, <laughs> and, and liked the ladies, and I think that's what eventually got him into yeah, that. Yeah, HIV <laughs> is, what, HIV is yeah. what got him. I mean, but, I feel like if he was going to live life to the fullest, he, him and Charlie Sheen was probably going to be your role models. Oh, God, <laughs> that's know? right. That's bad. But he was pretty good, man. I was looking at his stats. Oh, for I mean, sure. He was for no longer than he was, drove, he kicked their right. ass. Right, yeah. I mean, yeah. even even when he came in there and won in 87, he didn't race all year, just showed up and won his first race. You yeah. Know, just showed up and did it. Yeah. yeah. But the background's just completely don't match up but it does match up to the mentality of people you know that for the racing world i feel like this was literally batman and superman coming and flying around outside it was just on a racetrack and it was on tv you know this was literally a character battle coming to life i think they got creative for it produced a good marketing strategy it worked you know props up to them you know we that's what you know we got to do nowadays is pick another marketing strategy to you know boost the dirt track racing you know all the way around so i mean what, what's the answer to it i don't know i think there's a lot of people that just don't uh, take awareness to it i mean it was a, a big deal and, and not only that i think like i said i think it changed the goals of dirt track racers it changed the cheering of dirt track fans into one form to another I also think that it hurt indie car racing because you know the line was you know I want to be an indie but my name's not An uh, Unser Andretti, you know that also put it oh well I can't be that I can be I can be Jeff Gordon but I can't be indie guy. Yeah, to put it almost you know, out of reach. Right, exactly, and, and I mean a lot of kids watch this movie. I mean this was the adults now are the ones that watch this stuff. And how many people do you know say I love Jeff Gordon? And, yeah. and why, I guarantee you, most of the time, the reason they liked Jeff Gordon was because he was their dirt track representation in NASCAR racing that was kicking the asphalt guy's ass. Yeah, that, that's what I sum it up to be. Even though he did ignore dirt, like you said last time, yeah. but I say once again, that's because you're trying to play that part. You got to get them hooked into going forward. You know, Tony Stewart owns NASCAR teams and race teams. If he wanted to drive still, if he was having as much fun as he thought he needed to, he, that's what he would do. Sprint car racing is not any safer than NASCAR, I assure you. Yeah. But obviously he has way more fun driving on dirt and driving a sprint car than he did racing pavement. Well, actually, that'll lead us into our next topic, which is bad dog. Talk about these dirt track guys loving, you know, or that race NASCAR, almost like you just said, to build something else in dirt so that they can be provided to race. You had Kyle Larson this last weekend get uh, tweeted to by World of Outlaws. 
And the outlaws basically said, you know, when are you going to race World of Outlaws full time? He responded with 40. Well, a bunch of NASCAR fans and people just started tearing him down, saying that, you know, he if you don't love NASCAR more than sprint car racing, you need to get the hell out of the series. If, if you know, this and that. And then I'm sitting, there was one claim where he's like, it seems, a, a fan was like, it seems like you're just using NASCAR to fund your sprint car racing. And us as dirt track people, that's exactly what we're saying. <laughs> and, and, and we're like, what's the damn problem yeah. with that? I can't and apparently, Kyle Larson, but I sure uh, as hell would. Well, he, he, came, he did come back with the keep my job answer, uh, which was, I, I love all forms of motorsports. You know, that was the smart keep my safe. job answer. Right. We're talking about what you love and what you care about. Here's how I boil these sprint car dirt track racers that are in stock cars that you know we just said you know this is what i think really goes on i used to work for somebody and i used to go around and collect a lot of money i ain't nothing bad or, or illegal I, but i would go i would be collecting big checks and i'd had some a lot of money in my car so i was going to very big houses so I would say about 85% of the time, one in particular, I went to a house to pick up a check. I get to the door, I pick, I pick up, or uh, knock the door. It's a girl 22, 23, hot as you can think of. So she's like, hold on, let me get him. He's got the check. And the and guy comes to the door, he's like 60, 65. I mean, this is a giant mansion house. And I'm like, well, I ran to your daughter. You know, she didn't have the check. You have the check. Oh, well, that's my wife. You know, why is she with him? Is it because she, I mean, we're not going to say it's not possible, money talks. but is, is she with him is, for the money? Is that morally right? <laughs> you know, so when I, she's with him for the money. So when I think of these sprint car drivers in cup cars, I think of her. Right. I think of this 22-year-old girl that would really like to be with the badass dude on the other side of town who's, you know, working nine to five, a construction worker. Yeah, ain't got but no un money. unfortunately, she, she wants to have this security, all this money, this glamorous life. I'm going to go over here and be with those 60 year old men. So for Kylie Larson and Christina Bell, that's up in there right now, that's what I see. I say throw your career on the line and say the hell with you, you know, I mean, um, what do you think? I don't know. I, I think I think the best thing he could have did was come right back and say, "I love sprint cars more than NASCAR. What's the big deal here, guys?" There's per, probably there's Chip Ganassi who probably loves IndyCar racing more than NASCAR, my own car owner. So I don't think nothing's wrong with the world knowing that, but him having a financial backbone to be able to support himself for the rest of his life, and knowing if I bite my tongue for another five or ten years, you know that's a that's a judgment he has. Well, to hold make. on now. So so <laughs> say he says. I love sprint car racing more than NASCAR racing and say NASCAR or Ganassi comes out and says, all right, you're fired. All these people who know Kyle Larson now, he's going to go where? Start running sprint cars. What's going to happen? You think he's just going to go off the map and no one's oh, going to no. care? Sounds like to me there's going to be a lot of people going to find where this but, guy who just got fired, oh my God, it's all over ESPN. He just got fired from that. He's going to run these sprint car things we never heard of. Hell, that might have saved the sport. I couldn't imagine think about it. getting fired at that point. I what would you? Would be, well, I mean, you know, that, they, that, that's. I'm just giving that, the the worst scenario possible is because you said you love sprint cars more than NASCAR. They fire your ass. Sounds like that might be the perfect storm for racing because now everybody's it's on the headlines. This dude gets fired because he loves this sprint car thing you never heard of. Yeah, I mean, you you could be right. But you're saying just problem is ride the, money, the wave. You're yeah, saying ride the, the you're saying <laughs> ride the wave. You're saying stay with the sixty year old. The hell with the guy across town. I, I'm gonna sell him so for that dollar. I guess, man. Money drives the world, and if you really want a sprint car race big time, you got to have plenty of money. I know that. Are plenty of people to back you, and it's a man's harder life to find. changes when he's got a family involved. You know, if he's yeah. a single bachelor. You know, Tony Stewart say what he wants to say. Yeah, you and know, he kind of did. He, he does what he wants to do. <laughs> right. You know, a man that's got a well, and that's and, what built his fan base, saying what he wanted. Yeah, to say. sure. did, and, and that's. But that's he paid great for, for saying him. some things. Uh, well, too, well I, I agree, but I mean, it, but Larson it, said he likes sprint ass. cars. Hell, you had uh, Tony Stewart on there praising Hoosier on on Fox Four. That's you right. Know? I mean, so I mean, it's it's you know people don't have their own ways of doing it. You know, I, 
you know, I'm gonna be for my family at the end of the day, you know, whatever's the best decision, whether it's right or wrong, you know, true to it, you know, I, I can't fault him for that. You know, I look up to Tony Stewart for him being who he is, you know, but at the same time, you know, you gotta take care I, of your family. It's just like we said the last show, man, if you, you know, don't talk about how another guy's shirt fits unless you put it on and wear it yourself. It might not, it may look goofy on you too. You know, you, you never know. It just it's hard it, until you're in that until you're in that spotlight. It, it's hard to say. You know, I was like all the time. Perfect example. You're sitting in your your living room in your recliner. You just ate you a big old steak meal, and your house is air conditioned. You're watching a TV show, and there's two guys on an island, and one of them one of them starts to get sick. And the other dude eats that one. You're like, shit! I ain't. I would not eat my best friend. You don't know yet. You, don't, <laughs> you can't got nothing to compare it to. There, there's uh, no way of knowing whether you would or you wouldn't until you're in that position. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, in my opinion, that's kind of the same same thing. I, I you know, I don't, I don't know how I would have handled that, and I don't know that he handled that wrong. You know, nowadays those guys are under such scrutiny. If they say the wrong thing, it's a fine for this and a fine for that. And in my opinion, that's where NASCAR screwing up. Yes, um, because them you. guys, you know, they're leading a race that they're the driver's portion bonus is a hundred grand if they win it, and some screwball who has no business being in a race car drives through them and takes them out and just dipshit move, and they get out. And the first thing they don't even have the time. To hardly check themselves to see if they're okay, and they well, they got a microphone. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chad, <laughs> right, what, hey. what? How do you feel about that guy just driving through your rear bumper and putting you in the fence? You know, I'd grab the microphone and be, "What the fuck do you think? I, how do I feel? It cost me a hundred grand. I'd like to punch that dude in the mouth." And then you would get, oh, yeah, be a and then, new they, star. then they'd find me t- another uh, ten yeah. or fifteen. Well, and that's 000. the problem. Now I'm one hundred twenty thousand. That's the whole. Now I'm really mad. You know, that's the problem. Hey, yeah. Hey. That goes right back to them not having any characters, you know. I mean, they everybody need to have a little grace with those guys. At the end of the day, let them be themselves, you know. Don't don't be puppets on strings, you know. Yep. That's where they got them trained, you know. Sure. I also think that they're worried about dirt track racing threatening the NASCAR elite that they got going on right now because they are slowly dying over there. Their stands ain't filling up; it's emptying. And believe it or not, there's probably people out there who do like racing. And believe it or not, when you show them this dirt track stuff, they like it. Oh, for you sure. You know, so they may not want Larson to be talking about this sprint car thing, this Loch Ness monster. Absolutely. That nobody's heard of because when somebody goes and clicks on it, they might like the hell out of it, you know. I don't see why anybody wouldn't, in my opinion. I mean, it's loud, it's rowdy, it's fast. I mean, it's... It's, it's action-packed, It's too. a little bit violent. I, to me, it's everything that a, that a real rowdy, hard-working redneck... Who, you know would want to watch in his pastime in my opinion definitely all right so our next topic is money talkers and this topic's kind of uh interesting you know you hear the phrase money talks um we were talking about last time how the sports changed to where you can half-ass what did you say half-ass fabricator and yep. and, and a, a locksmith or something no, something <laughs> like that and uh you can you could win some races it did seem like with the Jeff Gordon era, you did start getting, you know, the 30-year-old racer, professional, getting a shot. Went away. It became be a 5-year-old in a go-kart, a 12- to 16-year-old in a late model or sprint car, and then 18 years old, if you're not on our level, you're a bum. Which I had an argument today where people on there can't understand how, you know, the NASCAR league is not like the NFL. To be in the NFL, you have to be the best. To be in NASCAR, you have to be rich. You have to be born into money or severe opportunity. Even guys like Kyle Larson, Christopher Bell, they were in hundreds of thousands of dollars of racing equipment at 14, 15, 16 years old. You can't go mow. I don't care how many yards you mow, you ain't going to afford that. So, I mean, these guys, you know, when that era started to happen, seemed like that's when people who didn't know kids didn't know how to make or fabricate this stuff and mom and dad you know they just wanted to their kids are talking about being a race car driver okay we got a couple million dollars let's do it you know that's kind of the that's kind of the push that came along and it seemed like that's when you saw a lot of people who didn't know how to do anything no fabrication no 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 build it yourself in garage started buying things from people who did know how to do it that's when you saw businesses start up that's when you saw everything start being sold out that's when this whole movement occurred as well it kind of hurt racing because of the rich kid effect you had a lot of people who were willing to just buy stuff pre-made what do you think oh no doubt i i guarantee you jason's guilty of this and i know i am 
the guy's got some money and you know he's he's around the house here fairly close and you're racing with him every weekend and, and putting a throw down ass whipping on him and then you know you, you start helping this guy a little bit in trade for him to buy you a set of tires or buy you this because you got plenty of talent and a little bit of knowledge about what to do on your race car but this guy is either new or don't know or don't have the time to fool with any of that and so you trade that out you know what i'm saying he helps fund your race program so that you can be faster in turn you give him some information or or you know some fab work or something and and step his program up to where he can be faster you know i mean i know i'm guilty of that on many different terms just because money is so hard to come by and just like you mentioned it's unfortunate but if you are out mowing grass or putting glass in or hanging steel buildings or whatever the hell you do for a living hauling shit down the road for other people you don't have time to to work on your race car and and figure out what's going on and 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 stay up with the the technical side of it in in my opinion you know so then you start to fall behind because you're trying to make money and and that's just a vicious cycle that dirt racing tends to have in my opinion if you don't ever get enough money to pull out and do it full time to where you can really devote the attention to it that you need and harvest those relationships with motor builders and chassis manufacturers and uh, the guys that are you know building shocks and a arms and these different things you know if, if you don't have the opportunity to do that then you, you you start to follow the wayside a little bit on that I don't think the problem is that money you know money was forced to come in because of technology Amen. technology come along you know you get two or three guys out there kicking butt well everybody else has got a you know competitive nature they want to be just as fast well you used to be able to figure it out what i'm talking about here is people just started making stuff and selling it more so than figuring it out yourself because people were starting to willing to buy it more because of this young surge that we had that guy that was kicking butt in the beginning you know the one guy back in his day that was really doing all the good you know he started realizing hey i can make more off selling this so right that's where the technology comes in he's sh- sharing the technology for wealth you yep. know so he's getting income in return and, you know get three or four guys out there start doing that then you know money starts coming more into it so and that, and, it, and it's just kind of the same now you've got guys that have that are manufacturing parts and pieces who've never really set foot in a dirt car and never drove but they have people that are driving and they're giving them discounts say hey man you know i i like the mechanical side of it and i like to watch and so i feel like this will work and and they're not idiots and and they you know they give this guy and that guy and this guy some stuff to try for free and they go out there and start you know kicking ass and taking names and all of a sudden they figure that works and so now everybody wants what those four or five guys have well the only place to get it is through this guy so he's able to sell the hell out of whatever he's making you know right uh another thing about this money talkers deal is is i was talking to them a little bit earlier is there's a lot of rich opportunistic kids out there right now and it seems like everyone's goal is to try to go be a stock car driver like that seems the there's parents out there putting in hundreds of thousands millions of dollars years talking about last time how much money it takes just to get an opportunity in this something that i would like to suggest a little advice for everybody out there who you know has a kid and you're putting hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to get them into arca maybe a truck one day and his dreams will come true maybe we should start shifting like i'm talking about how we should be celebrating dirt more as a dirt community maybe these parents also growing up might want to think well there's only 40 cars in nascar Maybe if we, you know, put some of our money towards growing dirt track racing, man, we got a hell of a shot to maybe be something big based on money and talent. You know, we don't necessarily need millions. We don't necessarily have to kiss someone's ass to get one of those 40 seats. We can build our own sprint car, or late model or local uh, race, race car and become famous if we built dirt track racing up and it became a little bit more mainstream. There's a lot of money out there that if a collective effort could actually occur, that there's enough money out there to get people more aware of it do you think that that would help those people as well because there are those people who have a kid bounce around saying i want to drive race cars for a living and they have a lot of money and they're like okay let's do it we're talking about millionaires out there and their only goal of making it is a stock car maybe we need those people to be like well let's let's make your goal 
to be a professional sprint car or professional late model or professional modified racer. Don't you think that would help to spoil a little bit more if these people were also involved on this? If the latter wasn't so much we're a minor league, which we're not, right. we just get minorly paid. That's the problem. Yeah. And I, and I think you hit the nail on the head with the minorly paid deal. And in, in, in my opinion, you know, those those kids, if, if, they, if they get harvested like they're supposed to and, and they turn into something, well, as soon as they gain a little bit of fame and start winning some races, if these people in NASCAR, which, you know, that money drives the world, if they figure out, hey, this, you know, these, this kid's not a terrible race car driver and, and it, his family got money, eh, we need to go contact him. You know what I'm saying? Now we get this guy. And then, and then what you tell mom and dad is, hey, you know, we're, we're, it's, it, you know you're spending $3 million a year to race, and your kid's only making, you know, 300000 That's what you're getting in return. So now we're going to give him 500000 and you still spend that same $3 million or maybe a little, maybe a million less. Well, shit, that's a smoking deal for them if they got right. you know, they got to spend a million dollars less a year and their kid's making more money or whatever, you know. Um, I, that's what I think and see happening. But it don't matter how you look at it without sponsors and – marketing it's it's hard to make profits you know as a as a driver a car owner you know car owners require sponsors to you know to come out ahead as well so i um, think the i think the mav tv deals good and i think that's helped um a lot because a in dirt late model racing well mav did, tv when you see the same damn commercial every single commercial break not like in slide the dirt as bad but if you see the same damn commercial every single commercial break that means they're not selling spots. That means they're not reaching people. That means people ain't watching it. The main problem with TV is most people have never heard of it. If they do hear about it, they already know what we're talking about right here, so it doesn't matter, you know? I mean, I do think Mav TV is doing a great thing, but at the same time, they're not reaching people either, in a way. They're staying alive by one of the greatest investors in racing, which is Lucas Oil. That's how they're able to even operate. Uh, but I do think that that could change if more, like I said, more heavily financed young racers shifted their goals from being a stock car guy is my goal to being an outlaw champion or, or Lucas Oil late mall champion or something. That is my goal. Turning dirt back into a mainstream persona. The only way, in my opinion, to get dirt racing to rival NASCAR or any other form of motorsport is TV coverage Media. because that is the that's the on, that's the difference between the two. That's of right. Them. That's correct. That, and, that, that's and, why I bitch about mainstream attention for our yeah, race car drivers. Yeah, if you could get your local media, your local news stations, if you know, if there was some way to do that to get them more involved and more, you know, you you were saying that that you know, Mav TV doesn't really maybe reach as many people as it should. It's a sad, you know, you. You have to buy a satellite package in order to receive that TV programming. You know what I'm saying? So you kind of have to almost be looking for it a little bit. Right. That's um, the problem. But, it, it, you know, the one thing I am glad, at least they're out there and at least they're doing something. Because, like, a few years ago, you, you know, ten years ago, you didn't see really Valvoline and Peak Antifreeze necessarily as a, as a main sponsor on these cars. I mean, there's some... There are some bigger player Optima Batteries. I mean, there were some bigger companies that came in and didn't just give money to the series, but helped some of the local teams, if I'm not mistaken. Well, you know, but that's also uh, those teams like Peak. You know, came with some uh, NASCAR affiliated teams. They did, but the, uh, and the Optima back in Batteries the 80- and Makita, they helped. You know, well, that's Cage true. Bolt and yeah. uh, that's true. The 28 car. What's his? I can't remember his name yes, now. Herb. Yeah. Anyway, they you know they helped some of those guys, but. Uh, Heyday of dirt, though. I mean, you had Coors Light, Milwaukee. Milwaukee. I mean, yep. you had all kinds of big corporations that were involved. That just got away because of the mainstream attention went away. You know as what well. we need? We need a we need another movie like Six Pack. There you, you go. know what I'm saying? Yes, drug I, race. Yeah. We need sure. another so, movie that doesn't lead every dirt please. track racer to an asphalt track. Yeah. Can y'all remember the Thursday Night Thunder? We used to sit yeah. down. USAC Silver Crown. We used to sit every Thursday. We used to come in and watch it on network TV. Yep. It wasn't on. Mav TV it wasn't on an outside TV source. Everybody got network TV, and what really, I was watching the show Friends one time. Yeah, it was within the same years. Jennifer Aniston was on the show, in the middle of the show, talking about 
the guy, whatever the, I don't even remember the other actor, but in the show, all he does is sit around watching Thursday Night Thunder, watching midgets run around on TV. Yeah. And she was making kind of plugging the them. scenario that she's like, I can't understand why. She's, I always thought it was midgets you know, being little people, and then I go over and it's race cars. Well, I thought so. the greatest exposure we've had in dirt track racing recently as far as mainstream media was, I don't know if you got to see it, it was a clip I saw on Facebook, The Bachelor actually had a segment where they went out and raced light models on a dirt track. I'm going to find that clip and put it in here. But, yeah, they literally went on a date, and they went to a dirt track and hot lap super late models. I thought that was the greatest exposure. But, once again, we talk about professionalism of the sport. Well, I guess we're just glorified go-karts to The Bachelor now. Yeah. Yeah, so this dude didn't race. He just went out and rented a car. They went went in hot lap together, two separate late models at a track. Did she kick his ass? Or I, did, I, I didn't see it. I just saw the little <laughs> clip. I, I just saw the clip. Yeah. I don't know how. I, the, I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> hey, the, hey, that leads us into our next topic: uh, late model mania, uh, Bloomquist. Uh, we 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 shocked you last time with the news. You probably just heard about when we took the airs, but uh, now he's out with the injury. Uh, he, is he draft dodging? Is that what you're trying to say over there? I don't know. He, he, I still he's rejecting he's, the draft for the cup or it, what's going sure on? It seems that like that. Hey. I, I hate to knock him because I, I always thought he's one of the greatest of all times, you know, and, and he truly is. But, man, you know, he's got to follow the rules for sure. Yeah. Hey, did, well, hold on now. Is it a rule deal or is it – reportedly he left Lernerville – to, to, to quit racing after hot laps or heat race or whatever or the second race. day second yeah. and then that's when they pulled another test for him to take he apparently had already left yeah are you hearing some other source or no that's no, that's the story i read he left and said he knew he was supposed to take a test you know some of the and this may be clickbait i don't know but it said that he left and at that point said he didn't realize that if he wasn't competing in competition that he was still forced to take a test well if they've asked you to take a test just go take one if you're you know if yeah. you got nothing to hide you you you, you gotta I, he, it's he's, he's probably heard after, people after laugh before, and joke about how he you know he's probably saw i don't know if y'all seen some of the comments out there yeah. about when he missed the dream p test but sure. i mean it's cokehead this this that it's it's drug accusations left and right and then you have a chance to clear your name why you know, it would be real know? nice to come out and be like, hey, I passed it. Hey, I'm, I'm retiring for the rest of the year, but guess what? I still peed in the cup, yes. and I'm cleared now. Y'all can't say I'm a little <coughs> drug head anymore. Your opinion, hey, man, this is some weird stuff here. So, I mean, it's not really weird. I mean, obviously the background is what has flared everyone's mouths on this deal. Yeah, for sure. I mean, unfortunately, you know, at some point he got a bad rap and got caught red-handed with something somewhere i don't know the the details um but yeah man it 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 sure doesn't look good in his defense you know what i mean but uh scott if you're watching i don't mind filling in for you and driving hey i already <laughs> had hey i was I about to bring done. that up who, who do you think should take a seat i had a vote for ricky thornton jr reason i had a vote for ricky thornton jr is this is exactly almost ties into the rich kid dude i was just talking about Right now, somebody like Ricky Thornton Jr., young guy, kicking ass, the dirt world's waiting for him to go to a truck. You yeah. know, I'm saying to hell with that line. I'm, I'm done with Cold Trickle's life. Y'all keep celebrating them if you want to. You used to have a hell of a lot more car owners on a local scene, regional scene, and national scene that would pick up a guy and put him in the car and give him a chance. For sure. That's why I said Ricky Thornton Jr. to the, to the Bloomquist machine, because... He's a young guy. He's probably not going to have the money to run an operation like that, like a lot of people ain't. But he's got the talent. He's got the, he's got the, the means behind the wheel. I think there's a lot of guys out there like him. That move, yes, it's possibly dreamish. But at the same time, is it really? I mean, this guy's dominating in IMCA right now. I think he won that race at Batesville mm-hmm. that you were at. Tw- how much was 20, it? 20000 20000 to win. So, I mean, it's not – we got guys like this. He's a very rare exception. You know, I put up – if you ask me about – talent i would put him right next to larson and bell i mean he's kicked their ass sim racing and he's run modifieds and sprint cars he won i think he won his first wingless sprint car race when he tried it out in arizona uh so i mean this is what i'm talking about right here you have an opportunity to do it but like i said tying this into the 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 last topic that needs to be the goal 
in dirt track racing is no we're not waiting for our young larsons to come up and go to trucks we need young larsons to come up and go to our big leagues we need to turn our stuff back into majors right you know so what do you what do you think about that who should fill that i got him a little rant there who should fill that damn uh uh zero car apparently everybody's uh who is it that's supposed to fill it or whatever Maybe what have y'all heard I you, uh the bronson or the overton guy yeah overton so yeah, i saw I heard overton was yeah. going but I mean, there's. What do you think about ideas like that, though? Young guys oh, getting no, shots. Yeah. I mean, there, the top right I mean now. there's a lot of them. Right. Rick Thornton's definitely one of the you know, best right now. Uh, you know, there's there's a select few across the country that you know Absolutely. could match that. You know, and probably be successful. You know, they're all. You know, that's the thing about racing. There's there's select guys across the country that are good. So who do you think should take the ride? You? Oh, absolutely. If I get to vote, I'm voting for me every time. Well, you, will, sure. you might not have motor problems like you did at Big O. Shit, I hope not. Ricky Thornton will be top, of, you know, top on the list, you know, out of. He, Ricky, and that would be a good second, jo- a good second choice. For and sure. wouldn't that make headlines? <laughs> what, hold on now, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it that make? would not that make headlines? <laughs> yeah. The only two headlines yeah. that you would give with Ricky Thornton right now, I think, would be going to a truck. Oh my God, here goes Cole again. I think everybody would lose their mind. Or Ricky Thornton Jr. gets a shot in. Scott Bloomquist, late mile. That would make headlines. Oh, for sure. And yeah, there's I a guess. lot of guys. Like, there's a, there's a few other. We got a lot of superstars in this sport who are getting old, you know, uh, that are going to have cars left over. And instead of trying to sell out their operations, let's start building this damn thing back to what it used to be, you know. Get young guys who can drive, make some headlines, giving young dudes a shot. I think that's a the next step is to do stuff like that. Yeah, I agree with you. New faces always, you know, bring attention. You know, that's we need new faces in our sport. We need new young guys in there to, you know, to bring new attention. You Hell, know, to even the, when a, even when a guy changes rides and goes from one team to the next, right, that it, makes it gets news, a little high. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, and it should, you know, what I'm saying because everybody's interested. Okay, well, he's changing brand of car and brand of motor. Everything's different. You know what I'm saying? Is he still going to do as good? Is he going to do better? I mean, you know, I, no, that. That idea of having of having Ricky drive for Scott would actually be pretty kick ass. Well, I mean, yeah, and, and especially someone like Ricky Thornton Jr. When you hear about young guys, it's almost got that Bell Larson kind of feel because this guy's up in Boone, you know, with with uh, uh, what is a bounty already you know placed on him. He's destroying people most of the time when he shows up. Him and uh, I think it was Gustin got into a little flip a few weeks ago at another track. Uh, I guess you you heard about that one, I saw that one. Yeah, what happened? What it. was you you did watch it? Didn't watch? Uh, what happened? It's hard racing, you know. When, you know, you could, you know, you got split seconds to make decisions out there. Um, evidently, Ryan or Ricky didn't like the pass that Ryan had put on him. Uh, you know, both of them are at the top of their game right now. Um, it looked to me like Ricky come back in hot. You know, made him made a mistake, got into him pretty hot, and uh, they both wound up, you know, tore up and. You know, his, you know, we're all guilty of making bad decisions at some point. That don't mean he's a bad driver because he's proven he's one of the best. Right. I just think with a driver like that, most people in their mind are like, is he going to go to a truck? When's he going to, you know, make the move? I say the move needs to be getting out of late mile, yeah. getting the sprint card. You know, the, our big leagues need to be big once again. Other issue here, Pierce. Bobby Pierce, did you hear about the dream issue with the tire? Now, apparently he appealed, and that's how he's able to race the summer nationals. But what's the deal with tires of late miles? I'm sure you've heard uh, this is, or even modified, I would say just as important. Uh, what's up with the tire doping deals? What's going it's, on? Y'all know this racing deal, so it happens, don't it? Oh, for sure. Guys that are winning are always going to be accused of traction control, doping tires. You know, some of them guys get on their game. They're going to win whether they – you could have brand new tires. They could have half used tires. They're still going to win. Uh, people are, you know, quick to accuse them of. No, this is a caught situation it's, here now. It is apparently uh, now. One of the theories on this was it was a world racing group hit on Lucas Oil drivers because the last guy they got was Bloomquist, who was Lucas Oil. Now they come and get Pierce, who dedicates to Lucas Oil. Is there any of that possibly going on too? Trying to you know jab at the other series stars. Was he or wasn't he? You know, who who knows? But he was committed to run the UMP Summer Nationals deal yeah. the whole next month. Man, you know? I, I, I'm, I, yeah, I don't know about that. It, it's hard to say. But we looked at um, some of the statistics in the research. You know, the, the simple green, some people said that it would show up in the tire test. And then they, you look at the 
molecules or I seen one of them sheets one time and it doesn't show up but royal purple royal purple and the purple power degreaser it does show up on the tire test high so I mean what I don't know you know I, I guess it's really up to the analysis to see what they really come up with I don't what know. are some stuff that people do with tires they oh, do do I, I, I there was I think about 10 years ago there was one group in southeast running late models dominating locally and it was like their tires would turn blue when they got hot or something like that and then they cool off and went back to black i mean what are all people doing out there with this stuff there's, yeah that's yeah there's, there's so much yeah. you, you don't you really don't know you just know it's about a, them you don't a, use them you just a, know about them. it's right? a question mark that you don't know yeah I'm, I'm guilty of trying you know tire chemicals and you go out there one night and you think oh that was the greatest thing then you go out the next night with it and you're now you're not trying them right now are you i mean there's competitors out here watching <laughs> no no i mean of course you know as 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 a racer you're always trying something but uh no and you know last year we did it two or three times just trying it on uh, at certain tracks you know and and you go out there one night and you think you're really great and you think your tires gonna last longer that's the big claim to it is making your tires last longer but you're not know. telling We're, everyone that you cheated last year right now, are you? Was it cheating? Is it cheating? Is it cheating? Not if I didn't do it. You said you just tried it. <laughs> you can't you hold it. That. Hey, I'm not. No, that. no. I, I swear <laughs> yeah. I heard him say we, we tried it a few times. Oh, tested it. Oh, you tested it. You, test it. You, so, you, didn't taste, but, you didn't test it on race night. But, but then the, then the you're next. You're getting red right now. The next time okay, you okay. test, you're so far off that you're like, that stuff hurt me. So it's you know I think I think every racer out there's you know tested it somewhere down the line. I so would have to agree. Every there, competitive there's just, racer. There's with just this, with so the much of it, man, and it's almost like moonshine. You know, it's hush hush here and there, and you know, it, but it's just why take the risk? You know what I'm saying to fool with that stuff, really. Like for an example, going back to the, what we're talking about, Bobby Pierce. The dream. Yeah. I don't see a guy. I could be wrong. Okay. Same thing with Scott when he got busted. I don't see if somebody that knows they're going to be testing for it at random, especially at a big race, who has already proven that he can win at any given time, why would he risk his reputation for that? Because the problem with, with getting caught cheating, whether it's you breaking the weight rule because you're too freaking light or whether you got – too many cubic inches on your motor or you're doping your tires or whatever forevermore once you roll across those scales light oh well you're you're a freaking cheater you know what i'm saying that's the only reason you ever won every race you ever were right. in yes. because you cheated you know what i'm saying or you tested tire stuff right. yeah i mean right. it just right. <laughs> yeah but it, you know it just if you ain't cheating you ain't trying i'm telling you right now there's not a racer out there that hasn't won a race at some point in time that has a big gray area. knowingly or unknowingly cheated. I guarantee you, some way or another. And it may not we even... We all wore gray for a reason. It may not man. even have been because he wanted to. Like, that may have been the only motor he had, and he had to put in a different cubic inch motor, or he may have, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there's all kinds of shit. I bought a used car one time that had some shit on it that wasn't right. Right. If, had I not known what to look for, you know, I could have went out there and won and, and got busted for it but i mean how, how often does that happen i mean i don't know you know what i'm saying but i just don't see i'm not saying that pierce did or didn't you know i don't know that um only, only he knows that but um i just don't see that it's plausible that those guys on that level at that caliper to go to a race like that knowing they're going to be suspect to being checked would take that risk in my opinion i know i i don't think i would you know, so once and, you made it that far, you're there. You know, there's no sense in taking right. the extra risk. So. Right. And unfortunately, you may get drove by by a no name somebody that's got his tires doped to shit. I mean, it, I'm sure it happens. You know what I'm saying? Right. But I don't. I mean, I don't know. It's just a. Again, you you just you don't know the pressure that that guy drives for somebody else. I may be like, hey, dude, if you don't go out here and qualify this time, and you don't go win, or you this, your ass is out. We're getting somebody else in here. You know, fuck, I might dope tires too. I don't know. You know, just depends. But you're getting really happy over there when you say that. 
think you, just, <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. <laughs> it's competitive nature to try to get the little edge on the next guy. I mean, you're bars and limiteds, all kinds yeah, of stuff, it's right? Whatever I mean, it takes. You're robbing yeah. designs. I mean, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> <laughs> this is that. That's it, right? That's it. Yeah, copycat. Oh, monkey, come on. Monkey see, monkey <laughs> he looked like he was about to cry there for a moment. Oh, I'm just kidding with you. No, we're all Roll good. purples, all it was. No, I'm just... No. Purple power. Purple, purple power. power yeah. Purple power. Okay, okay. Yeah. I know one thing. I don't I, know how they do all that tire testing, but I think what they should do, and I, and they may do this, and, and I'm oblivious. I, I've never got to that point where, where anyone gave a shit to test my tires, but they ought to take a slug out of each you know, two slugs. They ought to give Bobby Pierce one, and they ought to give that. That's how they you do. know, you know, and they both ought to send them in, and, and see what's up. I got up. mine tested with the USMTS, and that's what they did. They actually had a, see, I mean, we took and grooved a couple of grooves out of it, put it in their bottle. We put, they gave me two bottles. One was mine, one was theirs. They send it off. If that one comes back, if theirs comes back negative, and I have a chance to appeal, I still got mine. Gotcha. We put our signature on it. You put a seal tape over it, put our signature. I mean, it's pretty you know, professional the way yeah. they've done it. You, know, you couldn't, if that tape was broke when I send it back, they're yeah, guilty. You're, yeah, for sure. And, so. I, and I get that. But you know, the thing, and I don't know that the, that the lab can do this and the, the, the test may be too extensive, but there has to be a way to, you know, like, and I know that you can, but stuff that you could buy at Walmart or, you know, because cleaning your tires is, you know, you, if you, take a tire and race it on Saturday night and let it set in the trailer or out in the yard or whatever and it's got dirt on it and you let it sit there a week to 10 days that tire is essentially junk that dirt will draw all the natural oil out of that rubber and it, it'll make it harder than what it is and it, it'll stop the decaying process of that tire and just turbocharge it same thing if you let it set in sunlight you know so there's got to be a way you've got to clean those tires to get all the dirt off of them and rubber's porous so there's dirt down in in the tire literally so you've got to be able to get a way to kind of draw it out but i mean where is that line you know what i'm saying yeah. I, I don't know but i don't know i, I mean i agree with you 100 percent. i mean i feel like if I, they, they've got to be able to break that down and say hey these are the chemicals that we <laughs> won't allow or something you know and and, I, and again it may be too expensive to, to justify doing that I, I don't know but i think the analysis if, is, if they're going to get that technical they need to tell them what they put in it and show proof of that you know right. you know if it's degreaser you know what, what's wrong with the man cleaning this stuff right for sure you know right. they need to prove what it is I, I, I don't know the i mean maybe they can't i don't know yeah I, that's that's a dude that's a yeah, that's a forever touchy subject. Or give them tires. You know, they need to make them buy tires at the race that day. You yeah. know, that's the only other way to do it. You know, if they... Um, kind of like NASCAR yeah. issues the tires. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And if I they're going to do that, the tires need to be cheap, too. Sons yeah. of bitches, they don't need to be expensive. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I'll tell you something else, talking about that tire deal, that, in my opinion, would help a little bit is... You know, there's two things that that racers don't have enough of, and that's time and money. And I think that deters a lot of people because most normal people work at least a 40-hour job, if not more now. And if you're going to run up front on Saturday night at your racetrack, if you don't work on your race car at least 40 hours, you can hang it up. You're not going to run up front night after night. You might squirrel out and run up there every now and again, but you're not going to be in the hunt night after night after night. And it takes so much time away from your family and away from making other money and away from doing other things that you really have to love it to do it, you know. And so much time is spent on tire prep because literally that's where the rubber meets the road. You know, you, you, can, you can take a car that's not set up very good, put softer tires on it, and it's instantly going to be faster and handle better. And you don't do anything to the chassis part of it. You know what I'm saying? Right. So these guys that are spending all the time grooving and grinding and prepping and sipping I mean, that's why they're selling these machines for two or three thousand dollars these automatic sipers and all this stuff so you don't have to stand there and do that hour after hour if they just come up with a deal and said hey you can grind your tires but that's it you can't do anything else you buy the tire you mount it bolt it on that's it done run it if everybody's doing the same thing i think it would save you a little bit of time in my opinion one way to help the sport 
is you're going to have to save guys time working on their car, and you're going to have to save them money. However you go about that, but that that is the two big channels that need to be addressed. you got to save a racer time, and you got to save him money, and more people would be apt to do it. A good competitive racer spends as much time on their tires during the week as they do working on their race car, you know, just to be ready for, and you cut that time in half, you know, it lets, lets them focus a little more on the car, but there's a lot of, a lot of wasted hours on tires. Yep. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we're off into uh, one of the sadder situations of the racing news recently, and that was uh, Jason Johnson. Uh, of course, you, uh, even in your spot we have on Inside the Dirt, you were there to help change his uh, windshield out. Uh, you know, I obviously, I felt like Jason Johnson was a uh, representational driver in the Outlaws from this area. He was kind of like the hometown guy, you know, yeah. Outlaws. If you had one driver that you would be cheering from and you were from the Dallas, you know, Arklatex area, that would probably be your Gary Wright style driver who was up in there racing the Outlaws, you know. I can say this though, shit, he just wanted to win. Right, right. Hey, right. It was a great race. <laughs> I mean, was, you, you finally got that to was see. The best inter interview. You, you oh, did get sure. to see somebody challenge shots. That was yeah. a big deal as well. And, and I think him being the ASCS guy was a big uh, inspiring thing on that too, because he was kind of like the ASCS dude. And if I you, think. if you, I shared a, as much of that stuff um, as I came across and knew, and and a lot of the information that was in some of those write-ups and articles, I I knew the vast majority of it but there were some details in there that I was not aware of but man you you talk about a guy that had the drive and you, you talk about love the sport and sell out that's your guy because he put everything on the line I mean he literally you know just opened the schedule mom and dad said where you want to go or we'll pay for your education or you can buy me a train ticket to Williams Grove Pennsylvania I'll go up there because that's where the next outlaw show is going to be you know, and as they're rolling through the gate, you need any help? You need any help? I mean, just literally started at the bottom with nothing and built his own program, become his own car owner. It, I mean, it's just, that, that's the perfect, in my opinion, the, the, the perfect American dream. You know what I mean? Right. The, the guy just hard work, dedication, just never, n never any quit. You know, um, I did not know, I knew that he had had some adversity coming up but I didn't know you know some of the rides that had fell through and some of those types of things that you know pretty much I'm sure at the time were devastating to him you know to get the news that hey you're not going to drive our race car next year when you're expecting to or whatever um, but he always seemed to to just never give up on that and bounce back and just keep digging keep digging keep digging and it I don't know it just uh, it, that's what they ought to do they ought to make a movie about his ass really is what they should do because it, it would be pretty entertaining, I'm hey, sure. There, there's a few of them for for sure out there. Uh, what about uh, your thoughts on the whole subject? Of course, uh, he was this area, this region. Believe it or not, he run a wing modified at one time. Oh, so, yeah. I got to race uh, with him the night he did. Uh, he's definitely a good guy of the sport. I I met him that night. He raced with wing modified, but I, I really didn't know him personally. But, you know, I was a true fan of him. You're you always a fan of that guy that's you know works hard, you know, tries to from the bottom to the top, you know, the newcomer coming in with the outlaws and all of his accomplishments. So, uh, so we we're talking about how dangerous it is. You had a lot of people. I don't know. I feel. I mean, what are you supposed to do here in a way? Uh, some people I saw some, I guess, ignorant comments. Why don't y'all have safer, safer barriers or anything like that at dirt tracks and things along those lines? Um, safer barrier is five hundred dollars a foot. Uh, so if you want one around a half mile track, it's about $1.3 million. Um, I think a lot of racetracks would love to upgrade their facilities. <coughs> I mean, we're still off in, there's not so great restrooms at some of these dirt tracks. You know, what happened here was a situation of an if, you know, and there's a lot of ifs out there right now. And if dirt track racing doesn't start getting some awareness and these tracks don't start making money, a lot more ifs can happen. You know, we do need to improve a lot of facilities. Fences do need to be a little higher. There's a lot of situations like what happened at Volusia that is an if, you know, a few years ago when that occurred. Um, so, I mean, what do you think needs to change? I think we need to start, like I said, awareness, respect for the sport. You know, 
our sport getting, you know, like we were talking about, mainstream media needs to pay attention to us more when we're defying death than when we are in death, you know, because it is a death-defying sport. Sprint car, obviously, like we were talking sure. about, uh, one of the extreme ones. But I talked to the guy at CS9 who builds uh, Casey Kane's car, and we were kind of in agreement. I think that in the sprint car, maybe the length and width don't need to change, but the area around the driver needs to expand a little more. Casey Kane's car, he said he built with five inches more clearance on all the corners, so you can have a little bit more room. But I don't know. Did y'all both see the wreck that occurred with I Jason? It. It, I don't know. You know, it looked like that cage hit that concrete wall at about 250 mile an hour velocity speed. I don't know what you can build to really withstand that. Is this just a situation like I'm saying where it's a debt defined sport and we need to start getting some more credit when we're defining the damn thing than when we're dying in it? Unfortunately, we're in a sport where well, we're competing on the edge. We're, you know, there is bad circumstances happen you know that you know was you know every sport you know there's some form of you know casualties in some way you know whether it's football baseball um you know racing you know we're we're all there uh to ask you know the tracks you know the technology and safety has come a long ways over yeah. the years i mean it's it's steadily improving you know the every, vehicles have i can't say the same for most facilities i mean most of these facilities ain't making enough money to improve their facilities right and you know that's where you know the maybe the manufacturers or series you know need to regulate the manufacturers because on what they can do um uh, you know maybe put more bars in it maybe put more bars over their over their head i don't you know i think but the car the chassis manufacturers are not going to do that until the series makes them do it you know right. because if you if you weight your car down with the extra 50 pounds of you know safety right. material on a on a wing spring and car, there are teams known to cut tubing out of existing correct. chassis to so lighten them up even more sprint car racing really does i think it's getting to a point where you need to ask yourself do you want to have more speed or more safety because i mean they're fast they're, they're fast and, and, and i don't know what even if you were going 10 more miles an hour slower and even if you had a little bit more room i mean that hit that happened there i don't know what's going to hold it there ain't nothing right there that's going to hold I think that back the series need to look at the race tracks i've seen a deal where jason's the second driver in two years that's been killed at that at track Hoover Dam. yeah and could be a financial situation i'm sure all these tracks would love safer barriers and and, well, and, it, and it, modern it, fences sure and, and restrooms be. but they may not be making enough money to be able to afford it well, I know it takes a pretty good chunk of change to get a World of Outlaw race to show up at your Exactly. Racetrack. you got to throw 100 grand on the table and hope so you hit blackjack. My point is, you know, the Outlaws as a whole need to look at some of that stuff and go, are the places that we're racing? And, and trust me, guys, I get it. It's hard to get somebody to schedule your race in the first place. But at the end of the day, I don't feel like you want to – you, you, I don't feel like you. But there's the always an of the if. driver. You know but what I'm saying? But there's always right yeah, now with how the tracks are, with how the cars are. There's always an if. Yeah, for sure. Your best facility out there, I guarantee you, has got it. If this guy hits this, oh, if yeah. this right here right happens, that it, it, this is going to possibly never eliminate happen. eliminate every variable. It's not possible. You can't do that. That's where I say that you know the series needs to regulate the manufacturers to strengthen it up so what if it weights it down an extra 100 more pounds if everybody's got you know, to do it if everybody's got to do it everybody's on the same page you know it's um you know it's learn uh, and more people have died within the last three years in sports cars and rally then sprint you know sprint cars for us you know in the dirt racing world that's the dangerous car but in the racing world yeah there's been sprint car dies recently but there's been sport car guys mm -hmm. die there's been rally car drivers die you're, you're never i don't is it is this an it. element, isn't it? It's just it's, an element of being a race car driver. It's, it's the risk, you know, we take. You know, we're competing on the edge. We we know it when we go out on the track. You know, we don't want to see, you know, nothing happen to one of our friends. We don't want to see nothing happen to us. Um, we, you know, we understand the risk we take. Uh, we try to improve and try to work on the safety and try to do the best we can. Uh, that's where the, you know, that's where I stay. The series has to come in and regulate, make it, make that car heavier, make that car require more bars in it you know it's if everybody's on the same page nobody's at a disadvantage i think it does go back uh you know the safety issues the ifs would be dramatically decreased if 
this sport like sprint car racing for instance which is not a minor league it has so many competitors you're death defying so much out there you're doing that you're putting on a show you get no attention no awareness no no well you don't get attention while you're defying it you only get attention when you're death that just isn't right to me that is immoral and not righteous at all not just sprint car racing racing across the board because if it does change and people do start hearing about it and you know recognizing the defying moments more so than those sad moments, you start getting more money in the tracks. You start being able to improve your facilities, upgrading your bathrooms and everything else that these tracks need. Nobody's just gonna you know keep throwing money away you know at this stuff because I guarantee you right now probably 90% of the race tracks out there are some people who love racing. And there ain't really too many of them out there that's just making money. Nobody. I, I mean, so I'm, but they used to. It used to be a profitable business and needs yeah. to get back to that for these things to actually fully go through. Nobody wants that. I mean, it's, it's the years of seeing, you know, witnessing, you know, seeing the accidents happen. I, I remember seeing some of the cars my dad and granddad drove had chains for seat belts and they put bolts you know bolt in the nut to or the chain bolt them steering, in. the sprocket steering yeah the time and chain you know it's you know through the years hey. technology's gotten so much better the safety's gotten better right. i mean there's there's always room to improve there's never a stopping point at it i think the cars are severely advanced i think the tracks yeah. are not i, I would, think you have a lot of tracks that are left over from the 80s when this sport yes. used to be profitable, people it's, used to open and build tracks because you was making money. People used to come out and watch where it went down this damn road, but they ain't been able so, to improve since then because they ain't making no damn money anymore. So are you, in what you're saying, are you saying that the track, you know, was the cause of that, the car? Um, I think in that situation, think, even if there was that wall and then a fence above that wall, say he never gets to the billboards, I think what did it was that edge of that concrete wall like I said, he's probably hitting 110 right there when he got yeah. hit. And then you add the 100 miles per hour he maybe slowed down to by the time he hit that wall to the velocity spinning speed. So you're talking right. about the speed with that speed. You're talking about, I don't know what could withstand that hit. There's that's nothing right. that's going to withstand that hit. I don't think you could build five more inches. You're still going to, I don't even know it. Nobody really, I don't think, knows what the car looks like. Except the people that were there are involved and went over there and checked it out. But that, that that's... I, I don't know. I mean, that's a hand on an ant on a table. I mean, there, there's a certain things that are is, and once again, it is just a debt-defined sport, and it is a part of it. You know, my bigger issue is, you know, we don't have no attention due to that, due to this, due to that. So tracks can't improve. So it's an issue that you can't address because the money's not there. I still say you look back at the, you know, the first thing to look at is the car. You know, not that that manufacturer did anything wrong. But what can he do to improve on it? Uh, you look at NASCAR; they went to the car tomorrow. They made bigger cockpits, bigger. You know, yeah, they're uglier. They don't. They're. Uh, well, know, what they're in now is more resemblance to their original their, car. They went for safety, you know, in mind. Got a bigger cockpit. Got more halo clearance. Got more bars in there. They regulate them. Um, you they know, also owned all the tracks and. I mean, so you could yeah. do a lot more. You also had a lot yeah. of uh, corporate sponsors in there that helped the teams yeah. make these transitions. It's, so, it's I mean, money. It's, it, it comes back to my. I track. really think these sprint cars, I mean, you go look at them, there ain't much more they can. I mean, they're, like I said, talk to the guys CS9, expand the cockpits, I agree. Yes. But I, you you see that, that concrete corner right there, and you pop, hit it. That, that if happens, I don't know what you can do to really prevent that if. You slow them down. Yeah. You know. I mean, that's so even even then, it, I mean, do we develop some kind of uh, clear plastic around no, the corners that you can't hit if, nothing, dude? If you're talking about an if, it, it ne it's never ending because it won't be that. It'll be the light pole that's in the middle of the racetrack. It'll be the gutter right. drain. It'll. I mean, you'll never, you'll never safety proof all of them. You just have to learn from what you've got in every scenario and go. Okay, well, clearly that's not a well thought out and well laid out racetrack in the event of a sprint car or any car flipping and being able to come flat down on that concrete wall. So what or we need the, to do yeah, the is build a I fence that, that slightly leans over that. So if a car is airborne, it will hit the fence and hopefully deflect and fall back down on the dirt. You know what I'm saying? But isn't there corners and all those types? 
there's a lot of ifs. There's a lot of corners that are at a local track. Next thing you know, it'll be an inside wall that it was flipped into. Or yeah. I mean, I mean you said, not, like you yeah, said, telephone pole. Or if I mean, they pick the perfect track. You know, for everybody to make their tracks perfect, you're talking millions of dollars yeah. each. NASCAR can't even do that. Yeah, that's. I mean, there's. I mean, it just you either slow Jason them down. Jason loved racing. He knew the risk. I guarantee you. And and you know. It, it, you know, he, that's not. I'm sure that's not the first time he's ever been to that racetrack. You know what I'm saying? Um, and there's places I've raced when I left there. I thought, shit, that was stupid, man. That, that guardrail was sticking out, or you know, there's no, there's no wall or fence, and it's a 70 foot drop off that turn if you just run off the end of the track. You know, but you still show up and you still race. So, yeah. I, I mean. It's just who we are. I, I don't, you know. Well, uh, how you think it's got to be for a guy like Darren Pittman right now? Uh, I'm sure it's uh, very humbling and very saddening. And I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine. Sterling Marlin type of moment, probably. Or I'm sure. I mean, I, I we're competitors, but we all care about one another at the same time. You sure. know, we don't wish nothing bad on, you know, our worst. You know, competitor out on the racetrack. We still want you know their safety. We still, you know, I, I can't say that. Just I like I was saying, us. this right there. I saw a few comments. If if Darren didn't do this, if Darren yeah, gave him some room, I saw those comments. It's it, it, there's ignorant people out there on online world. Yes, yeah. that's that's people sitting back. But in his mind too, he's probably thinking, you know, like I'm saying, what's going through his mind? What if you I can't. didn't? He is the eye in that situation too. You can't change what happened. It's done. You know, he's he can look back, he can feel bad on himself. I I didn't really see, you know, the view I seen really wasn't I couldn't tell who caused what. I mean it's racing. You know, we're we're making split second decisions and you know, we mess up sometimes, you know, it you know, he can't you know, that's the last thing he would want. You know, if he could take it back, I guarantee you he would. Right. I have no doubts. He has to live with that the rest of his life. That'll be hard enough, I'm sure. Yeah. Right. My big issue is, like I've been saying, you know, all these ifs and all that. I I don't know. You only see our guys get any, like I said, attention when they're in the death moment instead of the defying moment. You know, I love to see Jason Johnson's Knoxville Nationals on Sports Center. You know, yeah, does right. it not deserve it? Oh, for oh, sure. Does, does, does Scott Bloomquist run two weeks ago, regardless of the drama? <laughs> Hell, that would have been mainstream that's, greatness that's, for them, that's, too. That's, that's that, that's that should be on sport. We should not TV. have to be yeah, waiting for to. a damn truck race at that damn Eldora Speedway to get attention by regular people. That just blows my damn mind. Darren Pittman, Jason Johnson should be on on air for their defined moments, not when they're in this, this situation that they're in right now. I agree 100%. All right, so next station, if there is one after that one. Um, I got this idea called National Dirt League. Here we go. We got this idea. Back to happiness, positive right. thoughts. We were just talking about yeah. attention. I was talking to a marketing guy, and he said the biggest problem in dirt right now is there's no way to really find out who's the best. You can always argue like Kinzer versus Bloomquist and stuff like that. I had this national dirt idea. Here's the idea, league situation. Nobody's, the biggest problem we've had in the history of motorsports, especially there in, in, in NASCAR versus IndyCar, in my opinion, in the 90s with the whole split and the whole connivings and all that. But everybody's trying to be the best. Everybody's trying to be the biggest of the big and I'm the, I'm the king of the whole, whole block. I think that's one of the big problems. Everybody's trying to be the thing, you know, in, in, in racing in general. That's what I think happened there with NASCAR. Racing was successful when it was multiple forms represented fairly. Besides that, my idea here with National Dirt League, you call up IMCA, you call up all these different sanctions, series two, you know, Luke Soul, you got an off-road truck series, you got sprint car series, you got this, you got that. And you take all their champions, all the divisions, you get about 60 different champions, you know. IMCA turns into the Dallas Cowboys, USRA turns into Pittsburgh, you know, big block, super dirt, UMP, they all have their own divisional champions. And you put these guys in those damn Yamaha dirt cars that you see, you know what I'm talking about, they, they have just came out with, and you put them in a show for two days straight to get your national dirt champion. That way a guy who's running a sport compact has a chance to go up against those. And that way the goal of Donnie Shots ain't just to win another 
Sprint Car Championship. His goal is to win it, but at the same time, you have an opportunity with that, and I think Yamaha would be all for something like this to promote their vehicle that they have, to where you can actually unify the dirt racing scene to actually have goals. You know what I'm talking about? A true goal overall. You want to make it to this. You want to become that. And that way you can have a, a true national champion. You know, what, what do you think about an idea like that? Some kind of some kind of league that gets it all together. Because that's what NASCAR has, stock car racing all together. They have all of it right there. Dirt track racing needs something like that as well. And we have too many sanctions for one person to just take it all over. It's a good idea, you know, if you if it could get all put together, that's, you know, that's the hard part of it, you know, getting it put well, together. We're in to a make pretty tough situation of awareness right now. Don't we all kind of need to work together in dirt? To per, per, it's back to the beginning of our show, you know, that takes money. You know, you you have to get some financial backing to, to make that happen. How much money would it actually take to just tell IMCA, hey, I just do what you're doing. I just want your champions for a weekend. How much money are we talking about there? I don't now you're talking about getting the vehicles together. I'm like I said, Yamaha would be. I'm sure heck the one that Donnie Schatz drove might sell for more than it was off the off the shelf. You know, so I mean, yeah. How much money are you talking about to even do? I, I'm looking at not that much. I mean, I'm looking at a, a huge upside in the promotion of the sport. I'm not looking at too much expense right here. For sure. Same There's a little winning. sport compact yeah. guy down here that could possibly yeah. go race uh, Donnie Shots and, yeah, and yeah, Scott Bloomquist. That, that would be that cool. Would be or, awesome. Amata, or Chris Elliott or Ricky <laughs> Thornton Jr. Be, or any of these guys. The beginning of time from, from the earliest days, you have David and Goliath. Right. And, 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 and at any local racetrack on Saturday night, There's if you, David can, versus if you can sell that as an announcer, you know what I'm saying? And that's exactly what you're talking about here. Dude, it would be – your problem would be finding a racetrack – and a facility big enough to host that fucker. Oh, I think so Lucas Oil Speedway out. is the best one. Lucas Oil Speedway or the Gateway Dirt Nationals. Rent that out another week. I, I, yeah, I, I it, look it at would be plenty. cool because just like you said, you could take a. What would end up happening is you'd take a no name, somebody from. Well, you have sixty Iowa. champions. I understand there. that, but you're going to take a sport mod guy from Southern Texas or Nebraska or wherever the hell he's from that that. You know, a hundred thousand people around his location have heard of, but I've never heard of. You never. Heard. And he and goes he, and whacks Donnie Shots' ass. Yeah, or whoever, or whoever, or whoever. You know what I'm saying? Then the whole world's gonna know about him. Right. You know what I mean? Um, it, I, it'd be a neat deal. Why and would Yamaha fact, not be behind this with that car? What else shoot, would be dude. a greatest marketing opportunity than something like that? So <clears> if I was, if I was them or anyone like them, I would jump all over that, you know. And here's the deal, doing like what you're talking about, nobody really drives those. So like if Exactly, you, the perfect I rock for dirt <laughs> racing. Yes. Right. Yeah. Nobody can, you know, you, you don't really drive though, you know, you take everybody I'm out about of taking, their element. I'm talking about taking the off road truck guys too. Yeah, but that's because what I'm saying. They're they taking everyone yeah. out of their element and putting them in something Let's that, see who's the best. Let's see who's gonna adapt the fastest and really be a race car driver. Because I'm gonna tell you another thing too. I've had several people that I've watched go from one race car type to the other and dude they're they're handing out ass whippings left and right mm -hmm. in one race car they get in the other one and they can't even Joke. line up yeah mm -hmm. that ain't no race car driver race car driver can get in anything that has four wheels and take that fucker to the front right you know what i mean right so if you can drive two or three different styles of race car and run in a top five or put both of them in a winter circle on the same night you're a race car driver in my opinion because you can drive a race car I think that dirt racing needs something like this. It would be awesome. Neat. I think It'd it neat. needs collaboration on that scale. And it's not really, the idea isn't taking anyone's power away. It's right. saying do what you've been doing. Right. Just when you get to the end of the year, I want your best. I want, your I want best. a list of names. And this, I think something like this would get your sports center attention. Because then you, and, and like I said, it becomes a little bit bigger because now a local guy like these rich kids we were talking about, oh, well, we can afford to run a modified all year. Let's try to make this deal. Yeah. Let's try to get this. Let's try to get, or all I can afford is a sport compact car. Well, now I can go race Donnie shots in a freaking Yamaha dirt track car, you yeah. know? So all your divisional regional champions, we're talking about 60 guys here. They ain't gonna be no slouches, right. you know, that I'm talking about doing this deal. But you're, you're also saying the Dave versus Goliath, 
I'm talking about a, a, a lot more than that. I mean, we're talking about. I don't, yeah, you got a lot of Goliaths and a few Davids there. Right. Just that no or man guy of, getting the opportunity to race them guys. Yeah. Will be, and it's be not a, a chili bow deal where you can walk in with a superior racing organization because we all know the chili bow is 200 cars with about 10 to 15 that actually can win. 200 drivers that can win, but about 10 to 15. This is an even opportunity right here. Right. No, I, I think you're on to something there for sure. And the thing that I like about it the best is that's, you know, you're not, you're not going to an open wheel car. You're not going to a late model. You're not going to a modified. You're not going to something to where, you know, if we're, if we're going to do this and you put everybody in a modified, well, then all the modified guys are going to have a little bit of an advantage. Right. You know what I'm saying? Or late model or sprint car or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I never – I've hot-lapped a sprint car, but I've never drove one. I couldn't tell you the first thing about how to set it up or do any of that. So if you took me and put me in the chili bowl, I'm, I mean, I can tell you what the race car's doing, but I'm not going to be able to tell you what to do to it. Right. You know what I'm saying? I have to have somebody there that knows what the hell to do to make the car feel better for me. If you do this, everybody's on a flat playing field. You know what I mean? That's the cool idea I think that you have here is you're not playing in, in, into anybody's wheelhouse. You, you put everybody in a pool and start with a blank sheet of paper. You know what I mean? Right. So you're going to figure out who is going to be able to adapt and drive and overcome obstacles the fastest. You know what right. I'm saying? And to me, that makes a good race car driver. You can't set them up. You know, yeah. the car, this is a situation where the cars, like I rock, cars provided, here it is. Everybody's on the same you playing field. You show up, draw a straw. And, right. Yeah. yeah. Ricky it's, Thornton Jr. next to whoever, yeah. you know. Yeah. It could be you. Could be a neat deal. Yeah. That would be cool. You'd think that some some big, I mean, some big time corporation would pick that deal <coughs> up, and they'd get that deal televised and, and call it, you know, the what you might call it. Champions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I call it National Dirt League because it's not copyrighted yeah. NDL. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I guess there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Second edition here with Talking Dirty. We'll see you next time here on Dirt Track State of Mind.